When you write your first operator in Kubernetes, it's pretty common that with that operator comes your first custom resource. Often people who write operators will tend to use the reconcile loop to do a get or a list on those resources. That's great for a first step. However, over time you'll find that's actually a pretty ineffective and slow way to find changes. For example, if you're only listing every reconcile loop and that loop has a back off, your list will become slower and slower. Not to mention, as you get more objects, you need to start thinking about pagination on those lists. There are some ways of doing this in a more economical way for the client Go library, such as using the cache and the shared cache to start to store that data. But what I want to talk to you today is how to use informers. And in fact, specifically what I want to talk about is how you use a, an informer factory, which gives you a nice set of methods for creating a watcher. A watcher is an event stream that is dynamically connected. And think of it like a pipe from the API server to your implementations, your, your client code, that can send back and forth uh, events over gRPC. What's really useful about this is you get real-time updates. You're taking a single event stream, so you're not hitting uh, a RESTful request on the API server every time and then having to compete against Quas. So I think one of the big problems is that people are well aware of how this stuff works, but the actual implementation in Client Go is pretty uh, undocumented, I think is the best way of saying it. And the way that I had to do this was reverse engineering it from tests. I've used this in the Open Feature Project now. I've used it in a few other operators. And I hope that maybe you'll see this video and think, ah, well, I can use a watch stream or an informer rather than having to do a, a get on your resource to look for changes. So let's just quickly remind ourselves of what I'm actually talking about here. So in the client Go code, which is the Kubernetes client implementation for the machinery you need to talk to the API server, you have effectively a few stages in what this informer does. So the informer that we're going to be using today um, is effectively going to be called the dynamic shared informer factory, which is a bit of a mouthful, but the dynamic part of that um, wording means that we're not having to use concrete types defined uh, in the client, and it can use the dynamic portion of the RESTful API to uh, elaborate on the type of open API spec it's looking to hook into on the Kates API. There's more to it than that, but I hope that that gives you an idea that this dynamic interface plus with the um, filter dynamic uh, shared fact former factory is how you create um, these watches. So that sounds like a real mouthful. But once we've got that, effectively that means that in our code, we will start to get um, a store of events that come back that pop off for us to be able to you to work with. So actually the, the pieces that are interesting to us really are going to be uh, really from eight onwards, which means that we can start to use things like add function, delete function, update function, and we can start to look into uh, the unstructured dot unstructured types that will come back or even cast them back into a, a Kubernetes type. So for now, let's take a look and uh, see where we're going from here. So I have my main dot go on my left. This is my dynamic informer. Um, and on the right, I have my my palette. So one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up as a really simple Golang project. From here, I need to think about what are the first things I need? Well, with any project, you need to set up your Go mod. So I set up a Go module file. Um, I also want to set up my VS code so that I can run it directly from here. So as a little trick, I'm going to click start debugging. You'll see that it gives me an error. So I'm going to create that uh, launch package file. The program is going to be dot for this directory. Here we go, kubeconfig. It's all one string. So that, in this case, is going to be my local user dot cube slash config. And we're pretty much uh, ready to go at this point. I might have an extra bracket there, but I think we're... Uh, we're okay. I, I, I also just need to quick check to see if I've written the env correctly. Right, so env takes objects. There we go. Okay, so we've set up our cube config. Let's just give this a quick run. Okay, great. It does nothing as expected. So the first thing that I would look for us to be able to do here is to actually pull in the Kubernetes configuration. So let's go ahead and do this. And I'm going to have a little utility function. So build configuration. 
And what this will return is the restful case config. So that's a rest.config or an error. Now I don't have anything imported yet. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this. And you'll see that actually autopilot is giving me some suggestions. So luckily what's happened is it's also detected that the client go rest API is what I want. So client go right now is on 0.25.2, uh, I believe, which is the most up to date. So we'll go with that. Also, I wanna make a few different changes here. So I wanna say that uh, I wanna do a kubeconfig os.getenv. We'll say that if kubeconfig is, is a nil argument, then we use the in cluster config. Otherwise, we're gonna do something else. So let's go ahead and cluster config, rest.config. We're gonna say that um, this is gonna be the uh, client, I think it's client command dot uh, build config from flags, cube config. Okay. Now, what I'll need to do is to pull these in. So I'm gonna grab these two packages. What you can see is the uh, packages at the bottom of VS Code will tell you that they're being pulled in. So let's just check what's going on here. What we can see is that's not being used, so let's return that. We also don't need to redefine that. The error is not being used here. There we go. Uh, what do we need to do? I think what I'll do is I'll actually put the error here. This looks like a scoping issue because error is being redefined inside of these nested uh, bits of scope. There we go. So if we're using um, no cube config, we'll assume we're in cluster, otherwise we're outside a cluster. So at this point in time, we can call it, we get our, our cluster config. And if there's an error, we will exit out. So we're in, we're in a pretty good place uh, at this point in time. So once we've got that um, cube config, well, we need to do a cluster of a few things. We need to now produce a client. So cluster client. And the client is the actual way that we interact with the API. So instead of using the traditional Kubernetes new client, we're going to use something called dynamic dot new for config and pass that through. So dynamic is a package within client go. And you can see here that it has a different set of methods. And it might be fun um, to take a look at these because the dynamic client works in a different way to the usual RESTful client that you get inside of Kate's uh, machinery within client go. So let's close that out. Let's now make sure that package is pulled in. Once we've got our dynamic client that's been set up, now we can start to think about creating our informer. So we need to know what resource we want. Well, I've got a cluster here and I've got a bunch of CRDs plugged in. Let's have a look. I'm working a lot with the Open Feature Project right now. So one of the CRDs in that project is called Feature Flag Configurations. So I think that's the one that I want to look at. So I'm gonna say resource. Now, I need to pull this in somehow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to either pull in the, um, the CRD file, so the API um, Golang struct, from that project, or I can define it as a group resource version right here. What that means is I need to be very careful to make sure that this all works correctly. So that looks nice for deployments. However, if I want to keep up to date with, a, with an, a, an external project, then I might do something else. So I know that the Open Feature project has this CRD in its GitHub repository, so I need to link against that repository. So the group version, and the group version will be um, feature configurations. Right, so v1 alpha 1, what is that you ask? Well, v1 alpha 1 is going to be github.com open feature, open feature operator, packet, uh, AP, I think it's something along the lines of APIs core. And I'll just check that and see if that's right. See if we can go get that. Am I right? There we go, that worked. So we're now effectively pulling in the information from that other project, which I prefer doing because if I do a go get update, it'll always be in line with which is the latest uh, version of that resource in the group name. So we're pulling in that uh, information about this resource here from the project that this comes from. 
Now what I need to do is to actually create a dynamic informer factory. Sounds like a bit of a mouthful. So new factory, and I promise we're not going into Java land here. <clears throat> so we're going to use what's called dynamic informer. Now this has a bunch of different methods on it. The one that we're going to use today is a dynamic shared informer factory. Shared meaning that you can share this across several resources that I suggest looking up a bit further on this. Um, this is perfect if you have a, an operator that wants to be able to look at several different uh, cluster, uh, cluster resources simultaneously. So let's see what the uh, IntelliPro, uh, the order suggestions put in. So I'm going to do this for all namespaces. You can see that that second argument there is the resync time. So the time that it will uh, cache between listing. Again, this is worth researching a bit more rather than me giving the wrong information. Now we've got the factory set up. Now we need to create the actual informer. And again, it's factory for resource dot informer, which is cool because now we're at the point where we have the ability to start adding event handlers. So this has a method which has this ability to have a set of uh, functions applied to it. So I'm going to add an event handler. So I'm going to call cache.resource event handlers. And within here, I can apply event handlers for various events. Great. Just to illustrate this, what we're going to do is we're just going to put a simple log message. And I'll just use a default logger. Now, right at the end, you'll want to uh, pass a context into this. You can also just make a channel, make a channel inline. So I can just go um, informer.run um, and make channel struct. I mean, this is a temporary thing to do just for this example, but you could also create a context and pass that in, and we can do that momentarily. Let's just see how far we get with this and see how many errors come up so far. I might not have even imported everything that I need. So first things first, it looks like I've got a bunch of issues here. So let's go go mod tidy. Let's try it again. I'm just going to run it. Okay, so it looks like it's running. Now let's go to the cluster. It's connected to my cluster through my kubeconfig. So I'm going to go to my feature flag configuration. Oh, we got a got a panic, panic here. Oh, it looks like we had a log panic. So let's just uh, simplify this a little bit. Rather than using uh, a logging client, which looks like it's come straight out of App Engine, which is the, the problem of doing dynamic imports like this without looking at what you're doing. Uh, note to self. We'll just do a, a friendly uh, fprintf, right? OK. And we'll just change this a little bit so that the format of directive isn't a nil. And we will change this directive as well. In fact, what I think we could do here is we could just use uh, a print line on the object, just so that we have something simple for now. And we'll come back to this later on. Of course, we want to start casting and all those sort of things when you're actually using this. I just want to prove that we've got something that works. So you can see something's come up. Now let's have a look what's going to happen now. If I look at my annotations on this feature flag, you can see I've got a foo. Let's change that to foobar. What we will see happen is that there is a new um, thing that's been pushed in here, a new message of foobar. It's a little bit hard to see because I have a, uh, a debugger that only has a few lines in this debug console. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how that works also in the console. So let's go on main. Let's pop this window out over here. I'll make a few spaces. You can see now we've got something that's just been pushed in. And this will contain my foobar 11, and you can see there. So that gets us, you know, some of the way there. I just want to give you the extra tips on how to actually make this useful. Well, 
what you need to do at this point is start to learn how to do the casting. So I would say something like uh, feature flag object, and I would make that our v1 feature flag. And then we would say something like um, we have to run the unstructured object converter, which is very um, usefully come up here in my autopilot prompt. You can see that what you have to do is to convert this into the flat map of unstructured or unstructured, and then it can convert back into your type. So let's see if that's worked. And we can do our panic. In fact, we'll do our, um, our format, print error. Otherwise, hello from object. And let's put the uh, feature flag object dot name in. Okay, so let's see if that works. Okay, that's the add command. And let's go and change the annotation. And you can see, hello from object end to end, I have been updated. So I hope that was pretty straightforward to follow. As you can see, it took me what less than 68 lines of code in a few minutes to get a high fidelity watcher that could be used in a client side application, in an operator, in a sidecar and beyond. They're very, very useful because using a watcher uh, is a much more economical way of interacting with the API server. There are more things that I could talk about, such as the way that watchers do uh, relisting and timeouts, but I think that for getting started, this is a great way to start to save yourself from doing those sort of polling lists and polling gets that I see very, very uh, commonly. Of course, under the hood, the watcher has its own implementation in the reflector, where it will use uh, gets and lists, but also it uses, as I said, the watch event stream, which is super powerful. I hope you've enjoyed this. This was one of my sort of short videos uh, on implementation in, in Golang, and please let me know if you like it. Um, please subscribe to the channel and hit me with a comment and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks again.